appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, as was uh, suggested, I'm going to speak on topics about new immunotherapies, precision medicine, and biomarkers for melanoma. And before I start, it's always appropriate to uh, make disclosures about interactions with industry. Uh, as Dr. Zarora mentioned, I do a lot of clinical trials of new drugs for cancer, integrating biomarkers, as was discussed. And so there are many different uh, disclosures here, uh, I believe all to be in a positive fashion. So for the outline of my talk, I'm gonna discuss current treatments and near-term clinical trials that you should be cognizant of in terms of next steps that are about to happen soon in the field. Biomarkers, which are um, things that we can use to predict better or worse outcomes from treatment, as well as the next generation of immunotherapy approaches that are rapidly coming forward. So I like to start my talk by going back in time a little bit to actually when I started my career as a melanoma oncologist was right around the year 2011. And at that time, uh, many people in the audience will be aware that treatments, unfortunately, for those with advanced melanoma were limited. And they included chemotherapy, which occasionally would cause the cancer to shrink, but generally speaking, only for a short period of time, as well as interleukin-2, which was one of the first immunotherapies to use, be used for advanced uh, melanoma. That was really only relevant to a small number of patients, however. As all of you are probably aware, however, uh, things have changed quite a bit now into 2020 where we have targeted therapies with BRAF and, and MEK inhibitors, as well as KIT inhibitors for the rare subset that have those mutations. We have immunotherapies with anti-PD-1 antibodies and CTLA-4 antibodies and combinations of those immunotherapies. And we even have viral therapies with telamagene, Laher, Pyrepvec, or TVEC, which we use as a direct injection into the tumor. And I'll come back to that a little bit later to build on some things that Dr. Devar spoke about. So this is what's referred to as a Kaplan-Meier survival plot. And I think it's important to highlight, uh, it's, this is the seventh edition, which dates back a few years to 2010. But really what it emphasizes is that, again, there were few treatment options for these patients, and these lines determine the survival of patients over years, as you can see here. And you can see that, unfortunately, the numbers are not very high, dating back to 2010 for patients who had advanced melanoma. What's tremendously exciting is that our field has changed quite a bit. And I'm about to show you that at this point, more than 50% of patients with metastatic melanoma can be assumed to live at least five years, if not longer, only taking single treatments. And we know that obviously patients take more than one treatment, and it's very exciting to think about what we can do to push this curve up, as we sometimes refer to it. And the data that support that statement are outlined here. And these are five-year updates of clinical trial data for BRAF and MEK inhibitors, showing that at five years, upwards of 34% of patients were alive. Uh, with immunotherapy as an anti-PD-1 monotherapy, with pembrolizumab, it was 38%. And with the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, the number was 52%. Now, there are important caveats to these data, which were these clinical trials were not designed to look at the five-year data point, and so their post hoc analyses have the potential to be somewhat biased. And these trials weren't accrued at exactly the same time. So it's not really possible to compare them directly, despite the fact I just sort of did that, but rather to make note that there is a substantial improvement in, this, in uh, the treatment options available for patients, such that we should be able to um, pursue these kinds of treatments to keep people feel, feeling well and living a long time. But obviously, we still have more work to do. Um, and it's important to understand which treatment might be applied to which patient. And in that regard, we refer to things like biomarkers, which can be tests that we might do, or even just observations that we might make about patients. So probably there's already been discussion or you've already heard about PDL1 testing to tell whether or not to use a treatment. And this is a complicated area. Um, it is quite clear that patients who are PDL1 positive uh, do better with immunotherapy. But very interestingly, when we look at the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, what we see is the disproportionate benefit for giving combination immunotherapy actually goes to those patients who have PDL1 negative tumors. And just for orientation, again, these are Kaplan Meyer plots where we see the time that patients did well over a period of months. And what you can see is that in the PDL1 uh, positive group, there's no real difference between just giving one drug or two. Whereas in the PDL1 negative group, it's clear that giving two drugs is better than one. 
very interestingly, you've probably heard about BRAF inhibition and the various drugs as well. And when we look at immunotherapy clinical trials for combination immunotherapy, what we see is that in patients without BRAF mutations, immunotherapy combination treatment is not apparently better than the monotherapy. But in patients who do have BRAF mutations, the IPI and NEVO appears to work somewhat better than the monotherapy. So we can consider all these things when we decide which treatment we might pursue. Now that being said, commonly in clinic, we actually don't use these factors and rather we treat the patient who's in front of us. And so we use what we call clinical biomarkers. In other words, how well is the patient doing what we call the ECOG status? How much cancer is there that we need to treat? Uh, more than three sites of disease tending to be high risk. We follow a marker called the lactate dehydrogenase or LDH, and then we look at the spectrum of where the cancer is. Because we know that cancer in some spots, such as brain, liver, and bone, tends to be higher risk. And using all of this information, we might decide to use either a monotherapy with an immunotherapy like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, or a combination like ipilimumab and nivolumab. It's worth pointing out, however, that our field is starting to align itself, coming together. Now thinking about combining BRAF and MEK inhibitors with anti-PD-1 or PDL one immunotherapy. And a clinical trial called the Trilogy Clinical Trial has now been announced as meeting its primary endpoint for improvement in how long the treatment is, uh, is working for the combining a drug called atezolizumab or Tencentric with BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Now this data has not been released to the general public yet, but we're all very excited to hear that this may be an improvement and maybe something that we can deliver to patients to give all three of these approaches at once. When we think about whether or not we might want to do that, however, we would like to be informed again of our understanding of the biology around the use of these treatments. And so when we think about immunotherapy, a lot of work has been done over the last 20 years or so to better understand who are the people likely to benefit from cancer immunotherapy. And a model for understanding this that's been advanced is referred to as the T-cell inflamed or non-T-cell inflamed tumor model. And this predicate for this is that CD8 T-cells, and those are kind of like cancer fighting cells, need to come into the tumor. And if they are able to do that, they make a whole bunch of other immunological processes happen. And you can see them all sort of here, one of them being upregulation of PDL1. Now, sadly, the vast majority of patients with cancer, although a minority of melanoma patients, they do not have this happen. So the immune cells never come in the tumor. And when that happens, if the immune cells don't come in the tumor, we refer to these as non-T cell inflamed tumors. And you can see basically there's an immune desert here. And these patients tend not to benefit from cancer immunotherapy. Now, these are what are referred to as immunohistochemical tests, where we try to stain the tumor for these markers to tell us whether or not the immune system is there. But fancy genomic technologies have come forward now, as was alluded to by Dr. Zoror, that we can measure this at a much larger scale now using what's called gene expression profiling. And we can translate this sort of a picture over to a genomic profile. And you can see in the middle here, this is a chemokine signature that's suggestive that the immune system has likely come into the tumor. And we can use these sorts of approaches in a research especially, but even in clinic maybe, to try to select patients or, uh, who are likely to benefit or those who are unlikely to benefit. The other observation in our field that's important surrounding immunotherapy is that it turns out the number of mutations in the tumor makes a big difference as to whether or not the immunotherapy can be effective. And that's emphasized by a cartoon like this to better understand that. We know that cancer is driven by the accumulation of new mutations. And in melanoma, predominantly, that's from sun exposure. But what can happen is that those mutations can lead to a change in the DNA sequence that when that turns into a protein, becomes an abnormal protein. And those abnormal proteins are referred to as neoantigens, and they can be recognized by your immune system. And patients who have more of those neoantigens appear to be more likely to benefit from treatment. So when we think about this triplet approach of combining BRAF and MEK and PD-1 inhibitors that I alluded to, our question becomes, is that the best approach? As I just mentioned, the tumor mutational burden or the number of mutations is enriched in patients who benefit from immunotherapy relative to those who don't. And similarly, the immune response as measured by that gene expression profile is enriched in patients who have a benefit relative to those who don't. So when we look at those who are benefiting from that triplet BRAF-MEK PD-1 combination, 
we can see what are referred to as waterfall plots, where individual patients are tracked across the top here. And this is the degree to which their tumors shrank, going from zero to 100%. You can see that many patients are having tremendous treatment response with much of their cancer completely eliminated. However, there's this fraction we see here whose tumors didn't shrink as much. And it's very interesting when we put that in the context of the biomarkers that I just mentioned, it turns out that's this group of patients here who have a shorter progression-free survival and have lower levels of tumor mutational burden and lower levels of T-cell inflamed gene expression. So it really raises the question of, with this triplet approach, are we actually expanding the number of patients who are likely to benefit? Or instead, are we helping the patients who would have benefited anyway to, help, to benefit even more? And it goes to show the complicated questions that are arising based on all of these different treatment options that we now have coming forward, and the complicated way that we need to make treatment decisions going into the future about which treatment would be best for which patient. None of this is to tell you exactly which treatment you might take, but rather to show the processes that the doctors are considering and that the researchers are used to better understand these different treatments. So what about other combinations that are on the horizon? And it's interesting to note that there are three randomized phase three clinical trials that are open for accrual and nearing completion in the very near term that will really change the way we think about all the different treatment options we have. So one of them is a trial called Master Key 265 where pembrolizumab or anti-PD-1 is being combined with TVEC. We'll come back to this. Another one is nivolumab anti-PD-1 being combined with another checkpoint antibody for the immune system towards LAG3 with a drug called relatlimab. And another phase three trial of nivolumab anti-PD-1 with a drug called bempeg aldez -leukine. You can practice that 100 times if you'd like. And that's a drug which is a variation of a drug we've used for a long time called interleukin-2. And you'll remember I mentioned it at the very beginning. So what are these clinical trials and what are their rationale? Well, in the trial of pembrolizumab plus TVEC, what we do, or what is, is taken forward is that the modified oncolytic virus that's approved by the FDA for the treatment of melanoma is injected into tumors while patients get anti-PD-1 immunotherapy with pembrolizumab at the same time or right after that. And what we can see on a translational biomarker level is that patients that do well have an influx of immune response, presumably due to the virus and the immunotherapy. So here are patients who have a partial or complete response, and you can see before treatment, there's a little bit of immune response, which is this purple or pink, I'm not sure how it's showing up on your screen, but after injecting the virus, there's a lot more immune response, and after giving the immunotherapy, there's even more. And this is very exciting as it tracks along with as we understand the science. What about that combination that I mentioned of the LAG3 or relatlimab? So you're aware that PD-1 or PD-L1 is a receptor ligand interaction on those T cells that limits their activity. It turns out there are other molecules that also regulate the activity of immune cells. One of those molecules being this one, LAG3, and, and uh, using an antibody against that, we can block it. And in patients with melanoma who have previously received immunotherapy and had it be not effective, we see that those who retain high levels of LAG3 expression on their tumor are those more likely to benefit from this treatment. And you can compare that to those who do not have high LAG3, whose tumors got bigger, whereas those who have the LAG3 tumors got smaller. And again, a phase three trial is reading out soon, hopefully, to investigate this combination of PD-1 with nivolumab and LAG3 with relatlimab. I also mentioned the combination of nivolumab with this uh, molecule, a CD122 agonist, uh, bempeg aldez -leukine. And this is a complicated molecule that uh, in a uh, fashion releases these IL-2 molecules to stimulate the immune system in combination with immunotherapy to make our effector CD8 cells more likely to kill cancer cells and to limit the activity of other regulatory mechanisms in the immune system like CD4 T uh, reg cells. And these are data from the early clinical trial and, and again, a waterfall plot of individual patients with how much their cancer either grew or shrank. And the very interesting thing that we see in this clinical trial are those patients whose tumors are PD-L1 negative. And again, those would be tumors we'd expect not to be very likely to respond to immunotherapy. You can see there are some patients who had a complete response. Their cancer completely went away and several others where it shrank quite a bit. 
suggesting that this combination may be able to overcome some of the resistance mechanisms that limit immunotherapy otherwise. So from there, I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss other factors that mediate immunotherapy treatment responsiveness. Uh, on the left, you can see a responder patient and non-responder. Uh, I like this, it's from sort of like the Jerry Seinfeld uh, patient example back from the 90s. And we mentioned already that differences in the tumor or the tumor microenvironment can definitely differentiate responders and non-responders with patients whose tumors have more mutations or have interferon associated T cell inflamed tumor microenvironments being more likely to respond. But what about other factors? Like what about differences at the level of the person or the host who has the cancer? So things like the age or the sex of the person, their metabolism or their body mass index. In other words, how large are they? As we're aware from other diseases, that things like germline polymorphisms or the regular DNA that's in every one of us can mediate our likelihood of having disease or recovering from disease. And in the current environment, we know some people are less likely to get infections and some people are more likely and some people get lupus and some people don't. What about host fitness? And we're learning a lot now about exercise, but there are some paradoxical findings that are worth discussing as well. So just to briefly outline, where is the field going? There's a lot of work now being done to try to interrogate people's normal DNA to tell us whether or not their normal DNA sequence could give us a suggestion of how likely it is they're likely to benefit or get side effects from immunotherapy. And I won't go through all of this data, but rather note that in the bold here are some genes that have been identified from patients with melanoma who seem to be more associated with side effects from treatment with ipilimumab or anti-PD-1 antibodies. And the interesting thing that we see from this list is these are genes that have been well known from the medical literature for a long time to be associated with things like autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and things like that. And we're beginning to do large scale genomic studies to integrate factors from the normal DNA as well as the tumor DNA into plots like this. And uh, one fun thing about doing genomics is you get to make these pretty pictures. This is what's referred to as a Manhattan plot where you can see the genetic data in various sort of wheels here related to different clinical issues. And you don't have to try to interpret this, but on the inner one, we see the likelihood of getting toxicity with diarrhea from immune therapy. On the middle one, we see responsiveness to checkpoint immunotherapy. And on the far one, we see how long do people live after getting immunotherapy. And the point with this is we're starting to integrate on multiple levels the genomic data that we can generate from the patient as well as from their tumor. What about the host fitness in terms of how healthy is a person? And we usually think in medicine that people should try to maintain what's referred to as a normal BMI, or generally speaking, be relatively slim as a healthy body style. Very interesting, over the past couple of we uh, years, we've observed from several analyses, first from the MD Anderson Cancer Center, but now from multiple groups, that in fact there appears to be a paradox in terms of the likelihood of patients with melanoma doing well over a long period of time. And these are, again, Kaplan-Meier plots of survival over time for patients with melanoma. And what we can see is that in the group who get BRAF and MEK inhibitors, as well as immunotherapies, that those patients, in fact, who are obese are those that tend to do the best relative to those who are normal. However, this does not happen for patients who get chemotherapy. And this is a little bit of a head scratcher. No one really understands why, and we're not going forward to recommend that people become obese, but I think does emphasize that nutrition and healthy metabolism are important aspects, and that we don't want patients losing a lot of weight during their treatment, because that seems to have deleterious side effects. So finally, what about factors that mediate immunotherapy response in terms of the environment? What factors do we come in contact with that may shape our immune system. And again, in the current atmosphere, the virus being one that we consider, but many groups are starting to think about the contents of the microbiota or the commensal microorganisms that live in symbiosis with us within say our guts uh, or in the fecal materials. And many groups have now investigated correlations of those bacteria with treatment outcomes. And this is analysis that we did when I was still at the University of Chicago where we analyzed the first 50 patients that we were able to uh, obtain samples with and looked at their likelihood of treatment response to anti-PD-1 antibodies. 
And very interestingly, when we allowed the computer to automatically select and separate patients based on their, mac their bacterial contents into those with responders and non-responders, we saw a sharp difference. In other words, there were clear differences between the likelihood of response and non-response based on which bacteria are present in your gut. And you can see that on the right-hand side uh, over here, what's referred to as a heat map, which a number of bacteria are associated with having a good response and being responders, and a bunch of bacteria are associated with a bad response or being non-responders. And we're not the only group that's been working on this. Several uh, groups published papers on this at the same time a couple of years ago now. The group from the MD Anderson showing a certain number of ba certain uh, bacterial strains, a group in Paris, and then our group in Chicago. I think the important thing to take home is not that we want yet to say that we know exactly which bacteria are the best ones, but rather that having a healthy gut appears to be what's most important. Because across these studies, we saw several bacterial species that are associated with a good treatment outcome. And again, going back into the medical literature, these are bacteria that have been associated with good outcomes across many different medical diseases. And it raises a provocative question, should we reestablish a healthy gut microbiome prior to starting checkpoint immunotherapy? And all of you are probably aware, or hopefully will become so, that the University of Pittsburgh with Dr. Zarrar, Dr. Kirkwood, and Dr. Navar have been leaders in this area, developing a clinical trial, apologies, to give back the fecal microbiome from patients who had a good treatment outcome in combination with immunotherapy with hopes that by restoring normal gut, uh, healthy gut, we'll have a better immune response and therefore a better response to immunotherapy. So finally, just to finish up, what if we do all of these biomarker, biomarker analyses and they tell us that in fact, there's probably not a very good chance that the patient is going to benefit from immunotherapy? What do we do then? And we're working on that question, and I want to show a few examples of that about where the field is going to harvest and mobilize the host immunity. So the first of these is a concept called tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or adoptive cell transfer. And this is a process where a patient has surgery to remove the tumor. And from the tumor, we grow the immune cells that are in the tumor. The patient is then brought back and given chemotherapy to get rid of their immune system and then given back their own immune cells that have been harvested from the tumor. And Dr. Kirkwood recently led the study that showed these data, which was upwards of 40% of patients who had already had all other treatments for melanoma were able to have a treatment response here. And we know that many patients can do very well with this kind of treatment over a long period of time. Another approach that we're thinking about is something called T-cell redirection. And there's a drug coming very soon called Tabentafusp or IMC-GP100, which I like to tell patients is a lot like immunological tape. It takes two pieces of the immune system, what's referred to as the T-cell receptor, as well as uh, another part of an antibody, and literally tries to pull immune cells into the tumor by latching the immune system cells onto tumor cells. And what we can see from translational analyses is that in some patients, this leads to the induction of those interferon or T cell inflamed genes, as I mentioned before, and that can show visually like this, where at baseline, there's not much going on in the tumor, but after giving this drug, we can pull the immune system into the tumor. And we're very excited about this as a way to restore immunity and potentially uh, uh, add to this by uh, using the drugs that we already have. Finally, T cell transduced T cells are very interesting. In other words, can we find a T cell from a patient who already bended from immunotherapy and then insert that T cell into another patient's immune cells and try to use that to treat cancer? And the example here is a patient who has their blood cells taken. We then put into their blood cells the T cell receptor from another patient who benefited and then give those T cells back to this person. And a number of clinical trials are ongoing in this regard um, and will require new biomarkers around HLA status and other things to help us better understand this. But it's very exciting because this, may, again, may be an option for patients where treatment otherwise was ineffective. So in conclusion, BRAF and MAC, PD-1, and PD-1-CTLA-4 combinations are all standard frontline options. And the choice really depends on a number of factors, which I'm sure have been discussed. I've listed a few of them here, but this is a common conversation to have with your doctor about what is of value and what your risk and tolerance of side effect profile is. 
There are well-described molecular biomarkers of activity in melanoma, BRAF, PDL1, tumor mutational burden, as I mentioned, but we commonly don't really use them honestly because we treat the people in front of us based on the symptoms and the disease that we see immediately in front of us. There are many more combination treatments that are coming forward, and I won't go over all of them again. It was probably somewhat overwhelming just how fast I covered them, but the point is that there's a lot of excitement that will continue to make progress for melanoma. And other biomarkers and therapeutic dimensions of host immunity are beginning to be understood, like the germline, our regular DNA, as well as the microbiome. And I mentioned these cell-based immunotherapies are rapidly advancing, and we're really excited about moving forward with them. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I think this has been a great symposium. I'd like to pass things back to Dr. Zarara and Dr. Kirkwood. So thank you very much. <laughs>